Superhuman Crusaders vs. Corrupted Heretics Soulless Monsters vs. Cultist Cyborgs Psychic Sages vs. Depraved Pirates The universe of Warhammer 40,000 is rife with epic rivalries. But there is one that I believe to be just as interesting as those I just mentioned, and yet that is not nearly as hotly debated as them. For that reason, I want to talk about it. What is, to me, the most interesting rivalry in this grim, dark galaxy. Biological engineering against meticulous evolution. Hybrid bioweapon against mutant apex predator. Orc versus Crude. Warhammer lore is extensive, to say the least. However, if we are to talk about the Orcs and the Crude, there are some essential things that we cannot get around. So I will do my best to try to explain as much as I can in 5 minutes. Go! In Warhammer 40,000 there are two universes. There is the material universe with planets, asteroids and stars. But there is also an immaterial universe composed of psychic energy, which echoes the material universe but does not follow its rules. A sort of warped mirror of reality, aptly named the Warp. Essentially in 40k most living things have souls which emit psychic energy and affect the warp with their thoughts and emotions. The more beings are alive at the same time, the more the warp changes to reflect their lived experience. Some gifted individuals, called psychers, can even channel the powers of the warp as psychic energy, which can be used to affect the material universe. This is not without its price, however, as the warp has denizens of its own. Putting that terrifying thought aside, what matters most to us is that, given that it does not follow the laws of physics, the warp allows for unbelievably efficient interstellar travel. So, if you travel through the warp, you can go from one corner of the galaxy to the other in a matter of months, days, or even moments. Especially if you build a network of paths connecting these corners. Eons before the first human ever stood on two legs, the old ones conquered the galaxy. Their actual name is not known, but they were the first sentient species to travel the stars. And they were not only hyper-intelligent, but also very powerful psychers. In fact, their technology and psychic mastery were so supreme that they managed to build a network of passageways in the warp, called the webway. As well as warp gates that would essentially put two worlds on opposite ends of the galaxy one step away from each other. Believing that biodiversity was a source of endless potential, the Old Ones used this network to spread and foster life throughout the galaxy, acting as caretakers and observers as they planted primordial life forms across countless planets. Given that their technology made them practically immortal, they would have been able to watch over a great many races as they evolved. But it wasn't meant to be. There were many who challenged the authority of the Old Ones. One of these races was the bitter Necrontian, who wished to have the secrets of immortality that the Old Ones guardedly kept for themselves. Deceived into a Faustian bargain with the Catan, star parasites made out of pure energy born during the dawn of creation, the Necrontier found themselves transformed into metallic, soulless Necrons by their cruel new masters, and were ultimately marshaled into war against the Old Ones. This conflict, known as the War in Heaven, lasted for thousands and thousands of years. The Old Ones were powerful, but there weren't many of them. As they were vastly outnumbered, they used their technology to create other races that would fight for them, among which two stand out. One was the Eldar, a species of psychic-attuned humanoids taught by the Old Ones how to navigate the webway, which were designed to be their elite. The other were the Krorks, designed to be the rank and file of their army. And, as you can guess, we will get back to them very soon. As the conflict raged on and millions of lifeforms fought in the war against the Necrons, their souls disturbed the war. The peaceful beings that existed within it changed accordingly, becoming horrifying monsters that invaded reality through the very portals that the Old Ones had once used to oversee the galaxy. Overwhelmed on two fronts, the Old Ones were defeated. Whether they became extinct or fled the galaxy is not known, but what is clear is that they vanished. And after managing to overthrow their Catan masters, the Necrons retreated into a deep slumber within their citadels, hoping to wait out the fledgling races. The galaxy had known its first great war, and it would never again know peace. 60 million and 40,000 years later, an Eldar Empire rose and fell, 
and a human empire rose and is currently on the verge of falling. And for 60 million and 40,000 years, the boys I've been breaking heads. Remember the Korks? Well, this is them now. They are known throughout the galaxy as orcs, and they are a rowdy bunch of brutes that speak with cockney accents and who only care about finding a good fight. So, how did they go from this to this? Well, when designing the Korks, the old ones were not looking to make a normal species that would evolve in a natural manner. They were losing the war in heaven, and they needed a race of super soldiers that would hold the line and do so efficiently, even with little to no support from their masters. To achieve this goal, they decided to genetically tailor the Korks accordingly. The consequence of this was that, with the old ones gone, the Korks were no longer supervised. And unlike the Eldar, who were a perfectly functional sentient species given every advantage in their bioengineering, as well as extremely advanced technology and knowledge of the webway, the Korks merely had to make do within the limitations of their design. This meant that, as time passed, they lost most of the advanced knowledge that they had, and their technology became increasingly more rudimentary. Given this, you'd think that they would be doomed as a race. The reality could not be further from the truth. In fact, at the time of the 40th millennium, orcs are the most populous and by far the most dominant race in the entire galaxy. It is widely understood that the only reason why they have not entirely taken over things is their incessant infighting. So, why are orcs doing so well? Remember that the ancestors of the orcs were designed to be the endless armies of the old ones in a war against literal star gods and their legions of soulless abominations. They needed to be resilient, capable, and blindly dedicated to nothing other than warfare. So, let us look at the design choices that were made and how they came to compound on each other to create the most efficient warmongers in the whole galaxy. If you've ever left food in the fridge for too long, you will have had the unpleasant surprise of finding out that it has become fluffier than it was before. I'm sure most of us have wondered how mold even enters the fridge, and the answer is surprisingly simple. It was already there. In fact, all around us, everywhere and anywhere, there are fungi, merely waiting for the perfect conditions to settle and grow, because that is all that fungi ever do. Animals move and plants have seeds, but the only way for fungi to move, other than spores, is to simply expand and grow. It's what makes them equal parts fascinating and terrifying. Fungi spread because it is the way they continue to exist. And while they may be a limited life form, the way in which they adapt their possible structures to the environment they find themselves in, in a way, is limitless. Few life forms are as efficient as fungi when it comes to making something out of nothing. It is only logical then that the old ones would design the quarks to be not only a single organism, but rather a hybrid physiology that combines animal and fungus. More than that, they altered the genetics of the species to yield a balanced ratio of orc types which can fulfill the needs of war. It sounds weird, but the best way to understand how this works is to explain how orcs invade planets. Okay, say an orc fleet arrives at your system. It's a bitter fight, but you hold your ground and kill them all, forcing the remains of the fleet to retreat. While you foolishly celebrate your victory, the spores have already begun to scatter in the atmosphere, and the orc bodies that you didn't bother to burn are sinking into the earth. Unbeknownst to you, your planet is already lost because from the orc remains and scattered spores will grow fungus. And from the fungus will grow squigs, which are both orc cattle and beasts of burden. Fun fact, although orcs prefer squig meat, they are omnivores. Don't think about that too hard. Then, eventually, diminutive snotlings emerge, and they will herd the squigs and cultivate the fungus more efficiently. Then the slightly bigger and meaner Gretchen pop out, and they start building orc settlements, as well as scavenging for resources that will be used in the war to come. And finally, orcs emerge, ready to start raiding and pillaging and becoming bigger and meaner as they do. Behold, a brand new orc ecosystem, right at your doorstep. Oh, shit. To make things worse, if any orcs escaped your planet on a ship, the first thing they will do upon returning to one of their planets is tell them about yours, and how good of a fight that was. 
Before long, other orc warbands will be heading for your system. And if you repel them enough times, they will most likely rally as a war under one great war boss, who has decided your planet is going to be on his bragging list. Okay, wait a second. This all seems a bit too convenient. How does every orc invasion turn out the same way? And why do orcs never deviate from this belligerent lifestyle? Could there ever be peace-loving orcs? What happens if, tomorrow, a great disaster falls upon mankind? Well, our systems of government and scientific cooperatives are deeply interconnected with our chains of production. So much so that a collapse in either side will lead to a chain reaction that will be very hard to stop. We may be able to rebuild in time, but to do so, we would need knowledge of our previous technology. And sometimes, that knowledge is lost. The Imperium of Man in Warhammer 40,000 is an example of a continuous state of collapse and reconstruction. The technology used in the 40th millennium is vastly inferior to what was used 20,000 years before. And what is left from that time is seen by humans as holy and incomprehensible. This simply shows that, during cataclysms, archives are erased, books are burned, and people die. Ultimately, knowledge dies with them. As a species, there is only one kind of knowledge that remains with us, and that is genetically encoded knowledge. Dogs know to salivate when they see food, birds know how to build nests, and spiders how to weave webs. Likewise, human babies are born knowing to hold their breath when they are put underwater or to close their hands around objects. Everything else we know, we learn from others. Now, imagine if someone had programmed our genetics in such a way that we reflexively knew how to build an engine, or how to perform surgery. Every orc is born with a predisposition for aggression, uninhibited by empathy or complex rational thought. But some orcs, aptly called odd boys, are different from their peers. They have innate instincts tailored for the more technical aspects needed for war. For instance, mech boys have a natural understanding of mechanical principles, to the point that they can put together ramshackle vehicles, whereas pain boys are born knowing how to best patch up wounded boys, even if their methods are not always very sound. The ratios of odd boys born out of an ecosystem were genetically programmed by the old ones in order to ensure that the species never got too intelligent, but also to guarantee that they had reliable access to the technologies needed for galactic warfare. The flip side of this is that, even if 90% of the orcs in a planet are eradicated, they will be able to quickly rebuild because their base technological knowledge is genetically encoded into the odd boys. In other words, unlike other species that rely on the transmission of knowledge, no matter how many orcs die, they will never dip below a certain technological threshold. Okay, so orcs are nigh irremovable pests that can never be nuked back to the Stone Age. Certainly that's enough. Surely the old ones did not give them any other nifty tricks, right? Are you familiar with the double slit experiment? Put in the simplest of terms, it's an experiment aiming to determine if electrons will act as waves or as particles when you shoot them through a double slit wall. It's crazy enough that it essentially shows that electrons can act as both at the same time. It's even crazier to consider that, depending on whether you are observing them or not, the electrons will behave differently. Quantum physics is weird because it seems that, past a certain point, reality may behave in a way contrary to what we expect, at least according to the laws of physics that we have already established. The best we can do is guess and hope that statistical probability is on our side. Which is particularly difficult when what we once believed to be fundamental rules of reality change due to our own interference. In that sense, the warp is essentially a realm ruled by quantum uncertainty. It is a sea of possibility, continuously affected by living beings. Their thoughts, emotions, memories, perceptions and beliefs all shape this immaterial realm. And this flexibility is what makes it into such a terrifying well of power. Because the warp can be used to affect reality by psychers in a way that is not dissimilar from how magic is used in fantasy. And this makes sense given that 40k is a sci-fi reimagining of a fantasy setting. Psychic powers allow one to foresee possible futures, smite their foes with impossible bursts of sudden energy, or even summon forth lovely visitors from the warp. And while these psychic powers may often be encoded into arcane tomes or ritualized in pseudo-magic chants, fundamentally all that a psyker ever does is manifest their consciousness and attempt to turn it into reality through the warp. And to do that, they need to siphon energy from the warp 
which, it should be clear by now, is not a very safe option. Technically speaking, the best way to use psychic energy is to have a large group of psychic-latent beings gather together and have them all think similarly. Orcs do not have conventional psychers. Instead, each orc generates a small latent psychic field. On its own it is insignificant, but gather enough orcs and this gestalt psychic field becomes a fearsome thing. All the more effective when you consider that orcs are fundamentally very uncomplicated beings, and their desires align extremely easily. Fun fact, some orcs, called weird boys, are conduits for this field. It's not a good time. If enough of them believe something is bound to happen, then it probably will. For instance, if the mechs build a stompa, and thousands upon thousands of boys believe that it will move, then when the mechs turn it on, it probably will move. For that same reason, a human should never try to operate an orc vehicle. If there are no orcs nearby, it will not work. Because of this, orc superstitions take on a life of their own. Red is faster, so if a vehicle is painted red, it will go faster. The color blue is lucky, and yellow gives wealth, and bigger explosions. Essentially, the reason why orc technology works when it shouldn't is that if conventional physics would get in the way of a good fight, then orcs will simply bend physics to let them get stuck in faster. So, we create a hybrid invasive species that cannot reproduce conventionally and is therefore incapable of evolving, but that is also extremely difficult to purge from the planets that it reaches. We limit their intelligence and creativity, but give them instinctual genetic pathways to learn the technology they would require to do war. We make them unable to have conventional psychers, but instead make them all inherently connected through a collective psychic field that is proportional to their number. When you look at things this way, it becomes clear that the orcs were meant to be a temporary solution to a larger problem. It is extremely likely that the old ones had a kill switch ready for them after they won the war, because orcs are clearly incompatible with their dreams of galactic life fostering. Such a species was never meant to exist without supervision. It was lab-grown, and it grew out of control. It does not care for evolutionary logic because it was not born out of an evolutionary system. Simply put, Orcs are a weapon, and the old ones understood that nature has no need for weapons. It is already cruel enough without them. The concept of convergent evolution tells us something fascinating about nature. Over the course of millions of years, life on Earth has found, and seemingly often returned, to certain ideal shapes and forms. Likewise, mimicry in evolutionary biology shows that animals are not afraid of copying successful achievements of other species if these can benefit them as well. As time passes, species strive to become optimal in surviving their environment by ridding themselves of the weak and preserving the strong, and evolution is the consequence of this. In the game of evolution, anything goes. The only problem here is that this game is slow. Its duration is directly tied to the lifespans of the individual specimens of a species. For most, it is not played over centuries or even millennia, but over millions of years. Now, imagine if, somehow, there was a species that could cheat at this game. That could, in a matter of mere generations, alter its genetics so fundamentally that it could pass for a different species. And that it could do so by acquiring all of the favorable traits of the other species that it hunted, of being capable of charting the course of its own evolution. Meet the Crute. Like many other starfaring species, their ancestors naturally come from one original planet, Peck, and it is not known if they were one of the many species fostered by the old ones, although they would have probably piqued their interest. If you were to ever visit Peck, you would most certainly be taken aback, because most of the animal species remaining on the planet are closely related to the Kroot. Krutoks climb its trees, Kroot hounds prowl its forests, and Kroot hawks soar its skies. The evolutionary race in Peck is over. And the Kroot won. Human beings have been meddling with evolution since we first learned we could do it. One could even go as far as to say that, without this meddling, agricultural societies would not have been viable, and herding would certainly have been less useful to us. Our species depends on the constant manipulation of the evolution of other species, mainly for the purpose of feeding our ever-increasing population. But this has also allowed us to profit from the qualities and abilities that they possess, and that we could never make into our own. Silkworms, rubber trees, and penicillin mold are all examples of life forms that, by some cosmic coincidence, just happen to produce things that we have found useful. 
That is the entire essence of the crude way of life, to find and use the qualities of alien life forms. With one small distinction, instead of manipulating the evolution of other species, they have been manipulating their own. Because crude are what they eat, literally. When you eat a steak, all that your body does is break down the meat to elementary constituents which will then enter your bloodstream. Crude work the same way, but with a small caveat. The unique properties of their digestive system make it so that when they break down their food, they do not degrade molecules to the point of losing genetic information, and therefore they can absorb the DNA of the creatures they consume. This means that, to the crude, diet directly dictates genetic composition. If they eat animals that can fly, in time they will grow wings. If they eat animals with significant muscle mass, they will in turn become bulkier. This ability is both a blessing and a curse. Most of the cousin species of the crude that populate Peck are evolutionary dead ends. Crude groups that consumed other species carelessly and mutated past the point of no return. This is why, to the crude, the acquisition of genetic traits is not something to be done carelessly. Their bodies and their future must all be shaped. Many human cultures have believed that there is a deeper meaning to the act of consuming an animal. By taking their life force and adding it into ours, the idea was that the hunter inherits the traits of the hunted. But what if that had been the case? What if the hunter who ate the mammoth's flesh gained its strength? The tiger would gift us its ferocity, the eagle its keen eyesight. Suddenly, hunting for animals is no longer a matter of subsistence. It is a matter of self-improvement. And one can only imagine that the same leaders who guided us in those times of old would have taken on the additional burden of learning the proper ways to hunt. Crude societies fundamentally rely on the wisdom of those they call shapers. These individuals exercise religious and ceremonial functions, lead the crude to war, and most importantly, determine what quarry they will hunt for the betterment of the species. This is not done through the aid of technology, but through a learned folk knowledge passed on across generations of shapers which is combined with a natural aptitude that some crude have for determining suitable genetic strands. To the crude, technology is a crutch. At least, this seems to have been the perception of their revered ancestors, whom the crude referred to as the Roots. They decided to willingly limit their technology to the bare minimum required for the sake of space travel, and almost do away with it entirely when it comes to the hunt. Crude travel through space in ancient war spheres, giant ships capable of travel through the warp and exceedingly rare in that they can descend from orbit to land on planets that the crude aim to saddle. Once there, the crude limit their weaponry to an assortment of rudimentary gunpowder-based weapons or technology scavenged from other races. Every new world is a new hunt, and every hunt is a test to the shapers. As the crude seek worthy prey, their shapers can identify that a certain quarry would be a formidable asset but may eventually find it inadequate for their kindred's path. Every shaper group has a different view of how they wish to form their kindred, and to ingest genetic materials that are incompatible with the path they are currently following could spell doom for the entire population. As they make these difficult choices, taking care to make note of every species they encounter, the shapers are ultimately expected to lead their community until they have made enough discoveries and acquisitions to merit a return to Peck. Upon their return, these will be preserved and potentially used by the crude in the future. And by now, an uneasy thought has probably crept up in the back of your mind. How do the crude transmit genetic knowledge from species that they have consumed? Nowadays, most human societies look upon cannibalism as a barbaric practice that belongs in our past. But our opinions are informed by the gift of hindsight. If our ancestors believed that consuming the flesh of the mammoth would grant them its strength, why is it surprising that they would think consuming the flesh of a defeated warrior or a revered clan member was a way of inheriting their prowess, as well as honoring them? To the crude, it's not just a question of ceremony. Crude risk their lives and often die on the hunt, all for the sake of acquiring genetic material. Of all the material they acquire, only some will be deemed valuable by the shaper, and this prize, once claimed, must be shared with the kindred. Obviously, reproduction is one way of doing this. The sources are not all in agreement, but it seems that the crude reproduce in a way akin to the Suriname toad, with females carrying eggs on their backs after coming into contact with the secretions of males. 
Whether the Kroot have always done things this way, or if this is yet another genetic advantage that they have acquired over time is a secret known only to them. And yet, as efficient as it is, it is still too slow. And if a Kroot holding valuable genetic material is dying, there is but one thing to be done. Cannibalism is the inevitable and most logical solution to preserve valuable genetic information. And once a society has determined its fundamental laws and its unbreakable taboos, it will build its culture and practices around them. Seeing that cannibalism is a core tenet of their society, one could be tempted to demonize the Kroot. But to do this is to forget that natural law is the survival of the fittest. Evolution is just another word to say that nature ruthlessly destroys the weak and favors the strong. We like to believe that what separates mankind from animals is that we have stopped abandoning our most vulnerable members and have instead chosen to support them and believe in their potential. But there is nothing to say that we could have not followed a different path. In fact, at times it feels like we have. With that said, practices like human eugenics are not comparable to the regular cleansing of genetic heritage that the crude practice. Shapers are extremely rigid when it comes to the preservation of bloodlines and strengths. And the corollary of this is that they are relentless when it comes to maintaining their kindred on the right path. This means that any undesirable mutants, once identified, are killed without remorse. And that the weak and frail are first on the chopping block if the kindred is facing starvation. It is a horrifying thought, but it is consistent with the pragmatism of the Kroot. To allow an undesirable trait to enter the bloodline is to compromise the entire kindred in less than one generation. To endanger a pathway is to limit the future of the species, as every path that is lost brings the crude one step closer to extinction. After all, the crude are not alone. The galaxy is a hostile place, and it only becomes increasingly more dangerous. Beyond the horrors left behind by ancient wars and the wrath of decadent empires, there is a looming, unsurmountable threat in the distance. And as gathering tendrils close in from all directions, the warp is darkened by the great shadow of a widening maw. What is the main difference between living organisms and viruses? Well, living organisms, like animals, plants, bacteria and fungi, contribute to an ecosystem. Their spread can lead to the death of other organisms, but they also allow for growth through this death. They can all feed each other, but they can also exist independently. Simply put, Living organisms are both consumers and producers of resources. Viruses are not alive. They are parasites that require living organisms in order to exist and remain functional only so long as they have hosts that they can drain of resources. In fact, the best way to describe a virus is to imagine it as a pattern of wasteful destruction, endlessly attempting to replicate itself by infecting its hosts. Usually, viruses are extremely small, to the point that they can infiltrate cells in the body. Scale up a viral infection to a galaxy and turn your cells into planets, and you will have the Tyranids. At first glance, you could think that they are similar to the Kroot, given that they too consume other life forms and acquire their genetic traits in order to improve themselves. But the Tyranids are anathema to the Kroot. In fact, among the taboos that all shapers follow, none is more important than this. Do not consume the Tyranid. Because the Tyranids are not a species. The clearest proof is that, wherever these creatures go, the usual choir of souls of the warp is deafened by the singular, ravenous thrum of one entity. Tyranids are the byproduct of a hive mind, a massive cancer that is not actually evolving but rather stealing information from other species that have struggled on the path of evolution. It is not hard to imagine that Tyranids only mutate in response to opposition, and that everything they have was taken from some other species that they extinguished. Planets exist only to be consumed, and strains exist solely for the purpose of extending the reach of the hive mind and removing obstacles standing in the way of this great devourer. Standing in stark contrast, the Kroot require biodiversity in order to thrive. More than that, it is against their interest to hunt other species to extinction. A species deemed too risky by the shapers of the past could become an ideal acquisition for those of the future. But for that to happen, it must be allowed to evolve. It is why the Kroot have been known to tame and form bonds with many different life forms that they have identified as not only being suitable genetic material, but also complementary to their lifestyle. In other words, as brutal as they are with one another, the Kroot avoid interfering in the evolutionary process of other species because it could mean limiting the future of their own descendants. They understand that nature is wiser than any science, and that it is the greatest shaper of all. 
The life that blossoms across the galaxy is its gift, and the crew have learned to claim it without greed. If the Tyranids are parasitic to life in the galaxy, then the Kroots are probably symbiotic to it. So, now that we have gone into detail regarding our two factions, who wins in the battle of Orc vs Kroot? Well, despite their differences, it seems that these two species are also very similar in many ways. Both use their own subspecies as beasts of burden and steeds of war. Their technology is scavenged from other enemies and while they love their guns, they are no slouches when it comes to getting in a melee. Due to how brutally they do battle, they are looked down upon by other species as savages and barbarians, but they often prove to be deceptively wily. However, if there's anything that I have hoped to do through this video, it is to show you that these superficial similarities hide just how fundamentally different these two species are. As to who comes out on top, well, the answer should be obvious by now, and it's rather anticlimactic. If the numbers are even, then the Kroot may have a fighting chance. But against orcs, numbers are never even. When faced with the overwhelming size of an orc wah, a Kroot kindred does not have the means to even come close. This is so true as to be canonical. The Kroot were first introduced to Warhammer as one of the races that joined the Tau Empire, a coalition of alien species united towards the idea of a greater good. And their decision was spurred on by the fact that the Tau assisted them when the Kroot were being overwhelmed by an enemy faction. Chance I guess at who that could have been. Besides, everything that has been said so far should make it clear that orcs can do everything that the Kroot do, but with advantages at every step. They multiply faster, they are more resilient, and they do not lose their knowledge upon dying. But this makes sense. After all, they are bioweapons. But this is also where they fall short. Orcs cannot grow. Their design makes them a limited race. Capable of adapting, yes, but not interested in changing or becoming different from what they are. The Kroot, on the other hand, have endless possibilities before them. No species in the galaxy has more potential than them because no species can change itself so pragmatically. But this also means that they require biodiversity in order to achieve these possibilities. Given time, the Kroot could evolve to become the most powerful species in the galaxy. But curiously enough, they presently do not seem interested in galactic domination. There is a deeper meaning to their way of life, a potentially endless search for self-actualization through evolution. I like to believe that the Kroot have abandoned technology not only because it interfered with their way of life, but because they recognized that they were not yet worthy of it, that they needed to improve themselves much, much more before they could dare to play with the fabric of reality. It was not a hard lesson to learn. All around them are decaying civilizations that thought themselves worthy, all of which failed and now seem to be merely hanging on to the memory of what could have been, and the knowledge that it was fated never to come true. And then there are the orcs, a race that was never meant to be and that remains only due to accident. Through a bizarre twist of fate, orcs find themselves in a galaxy torn by endless conflict, and they could not be happier about it. As empires rise and fall, things remain the same for the orcs. In a way, no species will ever know bliss as fully and completely as them. For as long as there is war, they will be a part of it. And if there ever is peace, then it means that the echoes of the last war have long since faded away. Maybe this was all part of the plan for the Old Ones. We could indulge in theories. Maybe the Old Ones knew about the Tyranid threat and were designing the Quarks as a solution to fend it off when the war in heaven erupted and forced them to repurpose their creation. Maybe the Kroot were also planned by the Old Ones and were merely allowed to grow naturally instead of being accelerated through scientific means. Regardless of whether these are true, one thing is certain. As different and incompatible as they are, in a sense, both Orcs and Kroot carry the legacy of the Old Ones. The Orcs are a monument. They remain as the proof of the Brain Boys' mastery over biology, of their unbelievably deep and complex knowledge of the structures of life, and of how easily these Titans could have bent the galaxy to their will through force. The Kroot are a tribute. They are the fruit born from the seeds gently planted by these nameless caretakers of the past. Their philosophy seems to aspire to a greater understanding of life across the universe. And it is definitive proof that they carry some of the wisdom of that ancient race. Because the Old Ones understood something crucial. What makes life a miracle is that it gives itself shape. It is an ever-changing painting, shifting alongside the canvas it is applied to. They understood that it was better to foster and watch over it because, even if they wanted to, 
they could never fully control it. After all, even in the grim and dark places of the universe, life can be brutally, cunningly and wildly defiant.